wavelength. Mental illness doesn't have to be a life sentence. Alcohol addiction, abuse, misuse is the same all over the globe. Sparking the combos about Adelaide. So it made me feel very confident that if we did have it in the state, we were going to know about it. You should be having... There'll be guys that are trained, but they don't feel like they're good enough to take their shirt off. Almost everyone is a culprit of doom scrolling. Anyone who has a mobile phone. On Fresh 92.7. Welcome to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. I'm your host, David, and tonight I am joined by Hamish for our very first show of 2021. How are you doing, Hamish? How was your break? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, it was fantastic. I didn't really do much at all, which was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly the same with me. I mostly just spent time at home. It was... Yeah. For the first time in a while. Mm, I know. So good. I mean, I thought I had had enough of my own four walls <laughs> in 2020, but no, apparently not. Apparently, apparently not. not. I can't get enough <laughs> of the place. <laughs> oh, well. Well, it was, it was a good break for me, though. I've, yeah. Um, did you get up to anything I didn't special? go anywhere. Yeah, yeah. I simply so spent... really like... did nothing. Yeah, I know. How, oh, how... Me too. <laughs> What a so waste of time. embarrassing, but <laughs> <laughs> it's the truth. And honestly, I loved it. It was great. I mean, it was nice to have a little break from Wavelength, but I have missed this show. Yeah, yeah, I've missed it too. I'm pretty keen to get stuck back into it. Uh, we're kicking it up a notch in 2021, aren't we, David? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. we got big things in store, so watch this space. Tonight, we're chatting everything Fringe and RCC. Last year, Mad March was the last bout of major events for most of us here in Adelaide. And since then, you know... We've been through a pandemic, but Fringe 2021 is here this year and it's looking like it's going to be brilliant. But how are the Fringe and the RCC going to look under COVID restrictions? We'll get to that later today. Wavelength is also going to explain the current push to get dancing back at our clubs. But next, Hamish is going to do a deep dive into the privatisation of SA's rail network. Looking forward to that one, Hamish. You're listening to Fresh. Wavelength. On Fresh 92.7. Back in 2018, just before the South Australian state election was held, current Premier Stephen Marshall had this to say regarding the topic of privatisation. We don't have a, a privatisation agenda. Since then, the Premier has gone against this statement multiple times, privatising power plants, prisons and health services within the state. Now, the Liberal government has privatised SA's train network, with Keolis Downer taking over the contract as of the 1st of February. One vocal critic of Mr Marshall's privatisation agenda is leader of the opposition, Peter Malinowskis, who came into the studio this week for a chat where I asked him if Keolis Downer were really ready to undertake such a task. Uh, well... No. Uh, that is an, an absolute answer that is not in dispute. We know they're not ready because they don't even have the staff to do the job. One of the craziest things about this privatisation, Hamish, is that uh, South Australian taxpayers are handing over $2 billion to this private company to run our train network, um, but they're not even going to run it because they don't have enough drivers to drive the trains at mm. the moment. They don't have enough passenger service assistance either. So what's actually going to happen now is the private operator is going to have public servants, existing train, train drivers, run the trains for them, but they're going to still be employed by the state government. So South Australian taxpayers are paying the wages of existing train drivers who are now in the public sector uh, to run and drive the train network, but then still pay Keolis Downer to run the train network for us because they were supposed to be playing, supplying the train drivers. They don't have enough. It is an, <laughs> I've got to say it is absolutely absurd that we're paying a private company to do a job they're not doing it, which begs the question, what are we paying Keolis Downer to do at all? There is no benefit to the taxpayer. This contract is costing us more than what it costs to run the train network when it's in public hands. So we're paying more money to the private operator, and what are they doing? Well, they're reducing the number of staff, they're reducing the number of train drivers, they're reducing the number of passenger service assistants who are the people who help the disabled or the elderly get an on and off trains. They're the people that um, are responsible for stopping fare evasion. So we've already got a diminished service and we're paying the company more. So uh, I'm of the very firm view that this is a bad deal for taxpayers. The point that we would make is what's the problem we're trying to fix here? I mean, if it's costing taxpayers more, if it's going to result in a diminished service, if it's going to result in, in less people being in jobs, what, what's in it for South Australians? Why is privatisation in general not really a good thing? I think most South Australians are, are over privatisations um, of essential services that really are the responsibility of state governments. Mm. 
Stephen Marshall went to the last election and he, he made a crystal clear statement, a promise, that he did not have a privatisation agenda. Mm. And then in a few short years since they've been in government, they've privatised prisons, privatised our backup generators, privatised hospital patient transfers, they tried to privatise SA pathology and COVID put a stop to that, thankfully, and now they're privatising our train and tram network. So, you know, it's a broken, it's a crystal clear broken promise from Stephen Marshall. Mm. And public transport is right up there with health and education as a core responsibility of state government. And as, and as a piece of policy that I care about because it's important on a number of levels. We want um, students, we want the elderly, we want the disabled participating in our economy and public transport is critical to that. Mm. More than that, um, we know that transport is one of the biggest emitters in terms of carbon emissions. Um, so if we're serious about doing something on climate change, you've got to be taking public transport seriously. These are important policy areas and South Australians care about it mm. and the government's got to have ex- accept responsibility for it rather than just trying to find a way to handball that off to an overseas company who we're paying two billion bucks to. So touching on Stephen Marshall for a second there. Yeah, sure. Uh, what do you say to his claims that you and the Labor Party are fear-mongering in regards to this issue? Well, I'd ask him to point out what, what we're saying that isn't accurate. Mm. I mean, he did promise that he didn't have a privatisation agenda. Um, It is costing us $2.14 billion. They don't have enough train drivers. They don't have enough passenger service assistance. So the state government's doing that work now for Keolis Dower anyway. Um, These are all statements of fact that are on the public record that are not in dispute. So the Premier says, oh, Labor's fear-mongering. Well, what what are we saying that's not true? Mm. Um, He can't point to a single thing. When the Liberals were last in charge in South Australia, they privatised the buses. And they promised that fares wouldn't go up. And yes, true enough, initially they didn't. But then eventually they did, and did in a very big way. That impacts patronage. Um, That drives down people using our public transport system. Around the world, where privatisation of train networks have have occurred, they've more or less failed, and we've seen governments of both political persuasions, left and right, bring it back into public hands because it doesn't work. The example that Stephen Marshall's government used when they announced this privatisation, they said, look at Melbourne as a great example uh, of where, how this works, or London. Well, it turns out that London has been a disaster. Turns out in Melbourne, their um, on-time performance is substantially worse than ours. It turns out their uh, customer satisfaction ratings are worse than ours. It turns out that they've had um, reports occur since the privatisation that had ended up delivering a net cost to Victorian taxpayers. Let me tell you about what was happening in Victoria. People were rolling up to stations in Victoria on time and they're watching the train that they're due to jump on race past them. Mm. They're standing in the Melbourne freezing cold watching trains drive past them that they're supposed to be catching. Do you know what was happening? It was a practice that was called station skipping because the train was... If the trains were running late, the private operator deliberately instructed for trains to miss a station to try and catch up time. (laughs) Now, imagine how you feel about that if you're trying to race to work or an important appointment or a job interview or a school or a lecture, or whatever it might be. Mm. That's not a satisfactory outcome. That's what privatisation delivers. That was happening in Melbourne systematically, station skipping, as a result of privatisation. We don't want to see that sort of behaviour here. We want the service to operate for people, not overseas profit. So if Labor does end up back in power in uh, South Australia, what moves would your party be making in regards to this area? Well, I've made a crystal clear commitment uh, that we will bring the train network and tram network back into public hands where it belongs. Uh, And that would be in the long-term interest of the state. It will save us money in the long term uh, and allow us to control the service. Uh, So we believe in it. That's why we've made a commitment to do that. I wrote to Keolis Downer before they signed the dotted line and I said to them, This is Labor's policy. If Labor wins the next state election, you need to be forewarned that we intend to take this service back into public hands. So they knew what they were getting into. Mm. Uh, They've signed a contract knowing that if Labor wins the next election, their game is up. I said, I I feel strongly about it. There's no point in just whinging and carping about it. I actually want to have a policy to do something about it. So the choice will be South Australians. Mm. At the next election, they can choose. They can... They can vote for the Liberals and then they can have privatisations of the train network or they can vote for Labor and have this network in public hands operating for public benefit rather than overseas profits. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Hamish, I don't know about you, but... Mm. 
I never expected that we'd be in a position this time this year to be having a fringe festival. <laughs> it's absolutely remarkable. Yeah. It's pretty crazy, yeah. isn't it? It's pretty amazing. It makes me really, really happy and really proud of totally. this state. It's a, it's a culmination of so much of our hard work and effort. <laughs> And, um, yeah, I mean, there was a lot of whinging and a lot of complaining over the last 12 months, but it's good to finally, you know, see the the payoff mm. now. This is the payoff, being able to go and do something like the Fringe Festival. Yeah. And then the fact that is one of the only things that didn't really – it didn't get cancelled, it didn't no. get pushed back, it experienced no interruption because it obviously it was – It was so on the cusp, though. It was. Yeah. I remember – I remember – they were like just winding down the last couple of days of print. Yeah. <laughs> and I swear everyone was packing up extra quick, you yeah. know. <laughs> like, it was like that last weekend of RCC, I remember everyone was freaking out yeah. because like yep. ScoMo had just started making all these announcements about yeah. reduced capacity, <clears throat> about reduced capacities yep. at venues and like t- saying all these major events are off and everyone's yep. like, oh, well, I guess we'll still go to the fringe. <laughs> and like yeah. nothing happened. It wasn't a bad thing. Like there wasn't really COVID here, I don't think, no. by that point. But it was, everyone was like a bit on edge. Yeah. And then it was yeah. nothing. And that was it. And now we're back. I know. It's amazing, (laughs) man. It's come full circle. But uh, it's great because obviously Fringe is just such a big part of this state. It's such a big part of uh, SA's identity. So we're really lucky that uh, we can go ahead and uh, kick it off again for 2021. Anyway, to find out how it's all going to happen this year, Amila went straight to the top and spoke with the CEO and the director of the Fringe, Heather Kroll. On Fresh 92.7. With majority of Australia remaining COVID safe, the Fringe is going ahead in 2021 in hopes of bringing life to all sides of Adelaide. In order to understand what would be different about how things run this year, I talked to Fringe Director and CEO Heather Kroll about what we can expect to see. Oh, this year the Fringe is going to look a little bit different because of the COVID restrictions. I mean, all the venues are running on uh, reduced capacity. There'll be a fair few changes when entering venues. There's a lot of, obviously there's the QR code scanning. There'll be social distancing. There won't be the bottlenecking of the big hub at the one gate anymore. There'll be multiple gates. For example, Gluttony will have four or five different gates. You don't just go to the one gate. On your ticket, it'll explain if you're seeing a show in a certain area of a big outdoor parkland hub, you'll enter through the closest gate it won't really we won't really see as many opportunities to just go out and hang around um it's really about booking a ticket what's the situation with international acts that have wanted to come and join the fringe there's been a lot of planning going on for months and months and but there are a number of international shows and some of them have already started landing in adelaide and they're about to embark on their 14-day quarantine in hotels and that's what they're doing at their own expense and so we just hope all the audiences come out and support them because artists and presenters at the Fringe putting their own financial investment on the line to put the shows on and the only way they make any money is if they sell tickets. I don't think Fringe Magic will... will Any final thoughts or comments? ...be lessened. The, The magic will still be just as good even though we've got all these restrictions. The tickets are selling so fast at the moment so I could just say to people jump on and buy your tickets because with reduced capacities we will see people selling out fast and don't miss out and also support venues in your local neighbourhood as well and explore the fringe far and wide. I also had a chat with crewmates Malia Walsh and Louis Corkaos from this year's Work It team. Coming to Adelaide from Victoria, the Fringe Act gave me the rundown on how it felt to know the Fringe got the green light after a tumultuous 2020. It was so exciting. I am just, like, Adelaide Fringe is my Christmas. It's better than Christmas. It's better than Christmas and New Year's and birthdays combined. We are over the moon. Yeah, it's so exciting. It's so exciting to be able to perform again and be amongst the community and be doing what we're good at. What else did the Fringe going ahead mean for you guys, whether it was emotionally or financially? I mean, I think venues are still at 50%, so it's it's not really about finances this year. It's more about being able to perform and see people and connect with people again. We're all from Victoria, so we've had a much harder 
lockdown, so this will be the first time we get to be on stage and, and be back with our beautiful audiences who we love so much. What kind of experiences did you have trying to perform before the Fringe? Yeah, I was headlining a show in Vegas and then COVID hit, the strip closed down, all the shows closed down and then I had 30 hours to find a flight to get back to Australia and I got a flight back to Sydney and then a little flight to a friend in Port Macquarie who put me up and I quarantined there for two weeks and then I found a car and drove to Melbourne just in time to be locked down there for quite a few months. Since you focus on acrobatics and a lot of it involves teamwork, how have you been able to stay fit and healthy during times where you might not even be able to see each other? Well, I mostly just ate on the sofa. I don't know about you. <laughs> um, well, actually, I did have beat sabering, which is a, a, a VR game. Um, so I had a headset and these two VR sticks, and then I played a game with these sabers where you're kind of hitting blocks to the music, and that actually kept me fit and made me feel like I was really cool when I was in virtual reality. And then if anyone saw me from the outside, they would have realised I wasn't very cool. So that was good. <laughs> Are there any final thoughts or comments either of you would like to add? I would I would really like to thank Adelaide and Victoria and, and the Greater Australia for being so amazing with, with the lock-ins and with being diligent with masks and taking care of each other so we can go and see things. We are incredibly happy and incredibly lucky to be living in Australia and have the beautiful Adelaide to be able to perform in. Wavelength. Sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That was Amila chatting with the CEO and Director of the Adelaide Fringe, Heather Kroll, and Malia Walsh and Louis Krakaos. Later on in the show, though, we'll be seeing how the RCC is going to work. But for now, we're getting into our brand new segment for 2021. Hamish, how about you give this a little bit of an intro, considering it's going to be your weekly baby? Yes, sure. Yes, <laughs> my little baby. Your little child. Yes. So basically, uh, last year we ran a segment called What the Hell's Been Going On In Politics yeah. uh, every week. Um, and this year we've decided to change it up and just broaden it to just what the hell's been going on in general, just in, <laughs> in the big wide world. Um, That's it, yeah. And just kind of focus uh, on the biggest headlines, uh, and kind of just hit them, uh, hit with them at a rapid fire pace, uh, with a little bit of that uh, trademark wavelength wit, a bit of that Hamish wit. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. let's hear it. The first, what the hell's been going on this week for 2021? What the hell is going on this week? Wavelength on Fresh 92.7. This week began with news that shocked absolutely no one when AFL club Collingwood was found guilty of systemic racism within its walls and the days since Eddie Maguire's last public apology ticked back over to zero. It was a rough week for WA who received a condensed version of last year after, you guessed it, a hotel security guard tested positive for coronavirus while bushfires also raged across the land claiming dozens of homes. Victoria, meanwhile, was going along swimmingly on course to hit 28 days COVID-free and now they're back to square one. New locally acquired cases in the state have thrown the city into chaos, casting uncertainty over the upcoming Australian Open. Footage also surfaced showing an employee at a local bubble tea store in Adelaide's Chinatown being physically assaulted by the alleged owner over a pay dispute. For a place called Fun Tea, it sure doesn't seem like a very fun place at all. Now, I'm not about to incite mob justice, but if you feel like leaving one of many humorous one-star reviews on their Google page, no one would blame you. Adelaide Oval decided to increase something other than their food and drink prices for once, revealing that up to 40,000 people will now be allowed into the stadium to watch footy matches throughout the 2021 AFL season. Scott Morrison suggested Aussies use the search engine Bing if Google decides to withdraw its services from the country in response to the new Media Bargaining Act. And it's predicted the comments have seen his approval rating drop lower than at any other point in his political career. A fitness instructor in Myanmar unknowingly captured the moment a military coup broke out with a convoy reaching parliament behind her as she continued her routine unaware. Shortly after, the country's military seized control of the government and declared a state of emergency. And finally, accusations of sexual abuse were levelled against serial weirdo Marilyn Manson by numerous former partners, making us all realise that maybe his act wasn't just an act. And that's what the hell has been going on this week. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Thank you for that, Hamish. <laughs> that was 
Brilliant. That was hilarious. <laughs> An amazing new segment. I can't wait to hear it in future weeks. Thank um, you. Thank I can't believe that was all in one week. It's yeah. like this last week had a billion things happen in it. And I know. A week is a long time. Oh, mm. The news cycle is crazy lately. <laughs> Three stories that I really want to chat about. Yep. First of all, fun tea, probably mm. the funniest thing. The bestest thing is if you go onto like Google Maps and look at fun tea, they've yeah. changed all the names to like fun tea MMA clinic <laughs> and like fun tea black belt karate. Yeah. So, I mean, I feel terrible for the worker <laughs> and the apparent rampant underpayment that's been going on there. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah, but yeah. I mean, at least we got a good joke out yeah, of it. Yeah, at least we got tea <laughs> memes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Number two, Bing. Yeah. No one's going to use that. Yeah. I'm what, sorry. What the hell? What the hell? You no. might as well just tell people to use Ask Jeeves. I would like, rather just use... I would, yeah, I'd, yeah, old mate Jeeves, I'd, I'd go to him before Bing, that's for sure. Man, I'm whipping out the encyclopedias before Bing. <laughs> yeah. I'm whipping out the, like, 12-volume A to Z Encyclopedia Britannica yes, before Bing. Yes, 100%, yeah, the hardbound covers. <laughs> yeah, just get a whole set for them at home yeah, before I use yeah, Bing. Sorry, Microsoft, no offence. Yeah, no offence. We love all your other products. Do we, though? That one has got to go in the bin. That's really good. <laughs> and the Myanmar story. Oh, oh, that's a classic, isn't it? What a great viral moment. Yeah. Out of an extremely awful situation. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so on brand for, you know, this decade. Oh. But I, I loved it. Like, if you see the video when she's dancing, it's <laughs> almost like the, 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 the big military vehicles that start kind of just creeping onto the horizon <laughs> in the background. They're almost moving in sync with her dance. <laughs> <laughs> it almost seems like it's choreographed. Oh, man. There's been some good edits of that too, mm. people just putting their own songs over it. Yeah, of course, of course. Because you can't have a viral video dancing moment without that happening. No, without 40,000 <laughs> other remixes oh, on course. TikTok and YouTube. That's it. Well, thank you so much for that, Hamish. L- looking forward to next week already. Wavelength. Earlier in the show, we spoke with Heather Kroll, the CEO and director of Adelaide's Fringe. But in recent years, the RCC Festival has become a major drawing card for crowds, putting on some of the biggest and best shows during Mad March. So with COVID restrictions in place and borders slammed shut, how is the RCC going to operate? Amila spoke with creative director of the festival, Stuart Duckworth, to find out. Wavelength. On Fresh 92.7. The RCC has returned to Victoria Square this year with the stables announced as their headlining act. Focusing on physical theatre, the festival will also include light installations and live music. To get all the details, I had a chat with RCC's creative director, Stuart Duckworth, about the plans for the site. The live music is a little bit secondary for our program this year, whereas live activation in terms of physical theatre light installations, big eye installations that can be engaged with and installations with lighting and sound that can be joined at all times rather than just specific concerts. Will there be a big difference in capacity due to COVID? Yeah, absolutely. We are dealing with SA Health and, and as they've been excellent to deal with and, and all of our plans have been approved through SA Health and as such we adhere to their guidelines. Current guidelines are one person per two square metres and that's only for usable space. So essentially we have half capacity of what we normally would have but we're really fortunate to have designed a site that can fit 2,500. So we think it's a really good size. So even though it's smaller than normal, it's still a, a very big site as far as festivals go. So we're really happy with the number we've got and we think that'll be a comfortable number for people to be able to socially distance whilst also having a great time because we're not interested in doing a festival if it doesn't have good atmosphere and good entertainment. We think we've hit a bit of a sweet spot in terms of capacity, program, live elements and everything else. Have you also been able to have a chance to collaborate with any local traders since in the past there's kind of been concerns about taking away business from people nearby? Yeah, of course. Look, my opinion on that is that uh, I think that got blown out of proportion back when RCC was back in the square, to be completely honest. We always, I was part of that event and I'm part of this event now and we always put um, our tenders and people in the area to be part of the event. Irrespective, we're, we're here now and we're talking about this year's event. We're really lucky to have a couple of vendors on board from the precinct. Due to time constraints, we didn't get as many from the precinct as we would like, purely because there wasn't enough time for those vendors to be able to put together an event offering. Doing an event offering for a food or a restaurant venue who don't, doesn't normally do it, it's a pretty arduous task. But we definitely have a few operators from the precinct and we've definitely been engaging with the stakeholders in the precinct, such as the central markets and that, the hotels, since before we applied for the use of the space with the council. Do you have any concerns about noise complaints since the curfew has been lifted? 
Yeah, look, uh, we were never going to go ahead with RCC in Victoria Square if the curfew was put in at 10pm. There was a confusion in council that we suggested that we would go only to 10pm, but that's never feasible. We always applied for a midnight close, and that's what we have. The council has since restricted us to turn off the music at 11.30. Noise concern is always a concern anywhere you are. Not everyone in the area is coming to your event, so not everyone is interested in your music, and so any event organiser needs to be mindful of the residents and the neighbours. So noise mitigation is something we take very seriously. We are governed by very specific guidelines with the council, which we have to adhere to, and there's a noise bond that we have to pay and a noise mitigation plan that we have to put in place. There's lots of procedural elements we put in place. Because of the way we set up this year, I'm very confident that we'll adhere to those strict guidelines whilst also giving the punters and the patrons a really good time. It's also been four years since the RCC's return to Victoria Square. Are you hoping to see that continue, that the RCC will host events at Victoria Square, or do you guys hope to have your sights set on something else in the future? Oh, look, uh, one step at a time in terms of the future of this event. At this stage, we'd love to keep presenting the event at Victoria Square if we're able to. We only have approvals for this year. Our eyes are focused on delivering a great event this year and we're not stepping too far ahead yet. But of course, look, if, if this year all goes well with the setup that we have and people enjoy the experience, we'd love to keep presenting it because we think Victoria Square is an amazing space. We think what we've got planned for this year will be an amazing experience and we'd love to build on that in the future. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That was Miller chatting with Stuart Duckworth about how the RCC is going to operate this year. With the fringe in RCC happening this year, there's absolutely no excuse to say nothing ever happens in Adelaide. And with our arts industry suffering the most from COVID restrictions, I really hope everyone goes out to some shows to support these massive events. Not only is it good for the economy, but it's good for the soul too. Suss some art some comedy and some music. You deserve it, Adelaide. Wavelength. Right now we're getting into another brand new segment. Last year you probably heard us go on and on and on and on about COVID with our weekly explainer of the situation here in Adelaide and elsewhere. But to be honest, we're really bored of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, extremely bored. It was useful, though, but I don't think, it I, was. I, don't think I ever want to hear about COVID ever again, though. No, no. <laughs> I'm getting reflux just with you mentioning that word right now. COVID-19, <laughs> coronavirus. <laughs> <laughs> so this year we're replacing that dreaded section with a brand new bit. Mm. It's called Wavelength Explains. Mm. Each week, one of the reporters from Fresh will do a deep dive into a topic close to their heart and give it some explaining. To kick it off, legendary reporter Jamie is going to explain the current push to get dancing back in Adelaide's clubs. Wavelength explains on Fresh 92.7. So we're deep into February 2021 with Fringe just around the corner and a month of festivities within reach of our dainty little fingertips. Adelaide laws are still prohibiting public dancing within venues and there are people out there pushing to bring back dancing into South Australia. I'm here to explain the Bring Dancing Back petition, a call to arms to reinstate dancing back into South Australian venues. Local internet music station, Ground Floor Radio, has launched an online petition stating that clubs and live music venues are essentially inoperable due to COVID-19 restrictions and that the government has been prioritising sports over the city's late night scene. Local DJ and co-creator of Ground Floor, Dan Gill, has kickstarted the campaign, aiming to highlight the forgotten industry and reinstate dancing into SA music venues. The petition has an arrow aimed straight at Stephen Marshall and argues that South Australia is the only state, except from Western Australia, currently in their own series of mini lockdowns, where drinking and dancing restrictions are under extremely strict circumstances. These are the current laws. Venues may introduce dancing into their venues by closing to the public and hosting a private, ticketed event. These are limited to one session per night and the total of the club's reduced capacity. The petition says that although the current climate has allowed venues and their staff to return to work with responsible conduct, the same restrictions on dancing remain in place two months after the last reported case of community transmission. Over 20,000 cases of COVID-19 have been recorded in Victoria, compared to just under 600 cases in South Australia, but Victorians are dancing. 
Over 1,300 cases have been recorded in Queensland, but Queenslanders are dancing. There is no other state in the country that has seen the need for such restrictions, as mandatory QR code scanning has been deemed sufficient for contact tracing. Let's also put it into perspective, with the test cricket having just finished in Adelaide, Sunday's pulled over 20,000 attendees. And Stephen Marshall has just announced that the capacity of the Adelaide Oval has been lifted to 75%, which means that up to 40,000 fans will be able to attend to the start of the AFL season. The entire hospitality and nightlife sector, including the Adelaide Fringe, RCC and the Adelaide Festival, are responsible for upholding the enormous economic contributions over this period to the state. This petition has grown to over 7,000 signatures in a matter of just over a week, which shows just how much this petition hits home. SA Parliament states that petitions with over 10,000 signatures get automatically referred to the Legislative Review Committee. Only just under 3,000 signatures are still needed, and this is your time to shine. If you feel passionately about this issue, you can find the petition at change.org and look up Reinstate Dancing in South Australian Music Venues, or you can follow the link in the bio of Ground Floor Radio on Instagram. Because if we don't have dancing, what do we have? Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. That there was Jamie letting you know all about the push to get dancing back in Adelaide's clubs for our first edition of Wavelength Explains. And it's really funny because I spent like a minute just talking about how we aren't doing a COVID explainer, but that mm. whole thing was about COVID restrictions. <laughs> you lied to us, David. You lied to us. Well, it was still very much to do with COVID. <laughs> It was. <laughs> I'm so ashamed. I lied to Adelaide. Yeah. I expect your public apology within the next <sighs> three days. Otherwise, you're cancelled. I know. I mean, about time. <laughs> uh, I mean, just a quick chat about that. Yeah, yeah. Like Jamie really mentioned, it's so absurd that these yeah. rules are in place. Like, you yeah. go to a club now, the amount of things that you have to do to get in mm. is crazy. You have, mm. to, you have to do the QR scan. Yeah. Um, there's a COVID marshal. Yep. Everyone's sitting on top of each other anyway. I don't, yeah. know if, I don't know if anyone who makes these decisions has been to a club recently, yeah. but there's not like there's not as much social distancing as they think is going yeah, on. No. I can't imagine what the difference is going to be with dancing. I don't really understand why it would make a difference yeah. at this point. And I think the thing is I don't think I've heard anyone actually explain what the logic is behind that decision. <laughs> there is no You know, like, like what is the, <laughs> it's like the standing up thing. Like do you just all of a sudden become more prone to the virus when you're on two feet, <laughs> when you're bipedal? Like yeah, what? Apparently. Like, I mean, the, the peak of absurdity of it all is you can go to your mate's house with like how many people can you have in a house now? Like 50? Now, yeah. And just dance as much and, as and you like. Yeah, full-blown you, house party. You don't have to sign a QR code there at all. Well, you do when you come to my house, but. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> that's weird, Hayley. Yeah, it That's is. really weird. Is it? That's yeah, what everyone is. says. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you're keen on signing that petition that Jamie mentioned in her story, just head to Ground Floor Radio's Instagram page and slam that link in their bio or just head to change.org. The more signatures we can get, the better, and hopefully we'll all be having a nice time dancing in our favourite clubs once again very soon. Wavelength. Welcome back to Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having. Right now, we've got our favourite weekly segment called Heaps Good News. This week, David, for the first time ever, has got the good for us. Let's see how he goes. I know there's gonna be... Heaps Good News on Wavelength. Welcome back to Heaps Good News for 2021. Now, this is my first time doing this segment, so be nice. I've gathered up some lovely stories for you all this week. I'm sure they'll put a smile on your face. The internet went nuts the other week when American superstar Jojo Siwa came out as LGBT. You know that weird girl with all the rainbows and ribbons and general over-the-top excitedness? Anyway, the Nickelodeon megastar recently told the world that she has a girlfriend. You know we stan. Speaking with Jimmy Fallon, Siwa said that she has the most amazing, wonderful, perfect, most beautiful girlfriend in the whole world. Aw, isn't that heartwarming? In other news that'll thrill the LGBT community, Victoria this week voted to outlaw gay conversion therapy. The new law makes it a crime, carrying a penalty of up to 10 years in prison or a fine of $10,000 for those who try to suppress or convert someone's sexuality. In addition to making conversion therapy illegal, the bill also gives the Victorian Equal Opportunity and Human Rights Commission the powers to investigate and refer matters of concern to the police. While nine Victorian MPs did vote against the law, 27 were in favour. In other good news, Nike has made a brilliant new shoe. Shocking. Hey, 
they made a new shoe. But seriously, this shoe is a game changer. It's laceless. You can just slide into it without even needing to bend down. And the first thing I thought when I saw it was, where on earth was this, was this shoe when my mum was yelling at me to bring the groceries in? But in reality, this shoe has been designed from the ground up for people with disabilities. The new Nike Goat Fly Lease will sell for $160 and the silhouette of the shoe is brilliant too. I really want a pair already. This last story is a bit of bad news, but a whole lot of good too. The bad news is that beloved music festival Groove in the Moo is off for 2021. The good news though, they're running a replacement for us all, all around the country. Called Fresh Produce, the festival is partly funded by the Australian Government's Restart Investment to Sustain and Expand Fund and will be a single stage outdoor festival. Though mostly in regional spaces, Fresh Produce in SA will be held at Wavell Showgrounds on the 1st and 2nd of October this year. There's no word on the lineup just yet, but hey, at this point we'll take anything, as long as the festivals are making a comeback in 2021. Wavelength, sparking the convos about Adelaide you should be having on Fresh 92.7. Well, that was fun. <laughs> First time for everything, I suppose. I can't believe you guys made me do a story for once. <laughs> yeah. We all thought it was about time David starts pulling his weight. He's pulling his weight around here. Yeah. Slacking off at Wavelength. Yeah, sitting time. up in his ivory tower. I know. Looking down upon the rest of us. Now you know how the other side lives. I know, it's hard. <laughs> it's so hard to find good news. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is brutal, that gig. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> And yet I make you do it every week. <laughs> anyway, that brings us to the end of tonight's show. Thank you for listening. Make sure you subscribe to the Wavelength podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can listen back to our old episodes right now, and you'll be the first to know when tonight's episode goes up. That's right. What a first great show for 2021. This mm. year is going to be a cracker for Wavelength, so make sure you tune in every Monday at 6pm. Thanks for joining me this week, Hamish. It was a pleasure as always. No problem at all. I had a great time, and I can't wait to do it again. Wavelength.